A Malthusian catastrophe is a situation in which humanity undergoes a forced return to subsistence-level labor due to a massive and ever-increasing, exponentially increasing population. This concept was posited by Thomas Malthus in 1798 in a 1798 book entitled an essay on the principle of population, and in it he stated, quote, The power of population is so superior to the power of the earth to produce subsistence for man that premature death must in some shape or other visit the human race, End quote. He then goes on to say that we are essentially wicked enough and have things like war and such and therefore there's a decent chance that our population problem will not become a world-ending issue because we kill off enough of our population quite regularly. But then he says of these problems we bring upon ourselves, which usually control the population, quote, should success still be incomplete, gigantic inevitable famine stalks in the rear and with one mighty blow levels the population with the food of the world, end quote. It should be noted that Thomas Malthus, who was a reverend, was nonetheless an early and enthusiastic supporter of birth control. He thought that self-restraint in that regard, that is not having sex, was the best way to control the population, but quite wisely and prophetically, I think, believed that it wasn't a plan that would scale well, and as such, we should make birth control the norm so as to avoid a catastrophe of the kind that later took on his name. Interestingly, there's also a group called the Neo-Malthusians who worry about similar things but tend to focus more on the environmental byproducts and catastrophes associated with exponential population growth rather than the purely human ones. This prediction by Malthus was just one of many seemingly rational arguments that only ended up being shown to be irrational later, because they in their time lacked the more complete data that we have today. There is no way that Malthus could have known, for instance, living in an age where there were still fewer than a billion people living on the planet, that one of the consequences of increased comfort and improved education and better health care and widespread longevity is that people tend to reproduce less, and that a few hundred years in the future, today, several of the world's dominant economies would resultantly be seeing a net loss in population each year, rather than an exponential gain. At least in terms of birth-to-death ratios, immigration numbers skew that math a little bit, but the overall population gain is not what it was predicted to be back in the day when they were at a different point on that graph. Another interesting population-based prediction, this one made in 1960 by Heinz von Forster, P.M. Mora, and L.W. Emio, predicted that on November 13th, 2026, the world's population growth rate would become infinity. The writers of this article, which was published in Science Magazine, were making a joke and having fun with the math and the data that was available, but a best-fit mapping of the available population data of the time seemed to indicate that an impending faster-than-exponential boom seemed to fit the math, and this in turn showed the limitations of the available formulas and data and suppositions that were being made by scientists, which was kind of the point of the article. This paper's position, by the way, was reached by assuming that technological improvements increase the planet's carrying capacity for population. So as we come up with new innovations like fertilizers and irrigation techniques, we are in turn 
capable of supporting more people on each plot of land. And more people and increased population then leads to more potential innovation and also investors, people who are participating in the economy and therefore able to amplify the development of new technology, which then in turn feeds back into the development of more carrying capacity. So an increase in any of these variables increases all the others and it becomes a cyclical, ever-increasing improvement cycle. At a certain point, you reach infinity, and apparently that point, according to this paper, is November 13th, 2026. Now again, this paper was a tongue-in-cheek position, and it was taken by people who knew that the logic unto itself was very sound, but the conclusion was quite ridiculous. It didn't take real-world issues and real-world frictions and variables into account. It's something that looked very good on paper and made sense in theory, but did not pass muster once the rubber hit the road. And that leads nicely into what I'd like to talk about today. Not population. I discussed that in more detail in a past episode. In this episode, I want to talk about the assumptions that we make about technology and society and how we cannot really know what we don't know until we get there, but how we try to predict beforehand, and rightfully so, despite knowing that our best predictions will probably be misinformed when we finally do arrive. You're listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. Let's Know Things is supported by its wonderful listeners. Leaving a review up on iTunes is immensely helpful, as is sharing the show with your friends or on Twitter or on Facebook or with a friend who you think is just geeky enough to appreciate it. It's also very much appreciated to contribute whatever you can and whatever you think it's worth. A dollar an episode would be amazing. Some people also choose to set up regular monthly payments through PayPal or Venmo. Whatever makes the most sense to you and fits within the realm of your contribution capabilities, it is very much appreciated by me. Thank you very much in advance if you are considering doing so, and thank you very much from the bottom of my heart if you have done so already. Another great way to help support the show is to check out our sponsors both of which are services that I am well acquainted with and love and full-throatedly endorse whether or not I actually benefit from promoting them financially. In this case, I do, which helps support the show. If you go to audibletrial.com LKT, you will receive a free month trial of Audible, which is the largest library of audiobooks on the internet. audibletrial.com LKT. We'll give you that free month and a free audiobook of your choice. Stay tuned till the end of the episode, and I will give a book recommendation that you might consider spending that audiobook credit on. And the other sponsor today is HostGator, which is the hosting company that I use for all of my websites and online properties. If you go to HostGator.com LKT, when you're looking for domains or hosting or web services of any kind, again, you help support the show. But you also get amazing service, best customer service in the industry, in my opinion, and you will get a discount that they provide to listeners of Let's Know Things. That's hostgator.com slash LKT. All right, let's get back to the show. What might human obsolescence look like? Is it something that would happen all at once? One day we wake up to find that we as a species are no longer necessary, and that all the trains are running on time, and all the food is prepared and really well, and all the laws are enforced, all without our help? Or does it happen in fits and starts? A line crossed here, another there, until slowly but surely we are weaned off the expectation that we are necessary to the continued operation of society, and perhaps even the propagation of our own species, and perhaps even the desire to be a necessary component to either of those things. 
There are two articles that I want to unspool today. The first one is from the LA Times, and it is entitled, Robots Could Replace 1.7 Million American Truckers in the Next Decade. And the other is from DigiTimes, and it is entitled, Foxconn Boosting Automated Production in China. The first piece about truckers digs into some of the deep issues around this specific job category and the immense possibility, seemingly at least, that it could disappear sometime in the relatively near future. Trucking is one of the last remaining jobs that provide a middle class or above income with a mean salary ranging around $40,000 a year in the U.S. in 2015, while the higher earners can rake in somewhere around or even above $70,000 a year if you include their overtime. Trucking has also been reported quite often of late to be the most common job in, I want to say, like 39 U.S. states, though this is apparently incorrect. The original NPR piece that reported that statistic failed to aggregate other job categories in the same way that it aggregated trucking jobs from different fields and with differing responsibilities. According to a piece on MarketWatch, which I will link to in the show notes along with all of the other references for this episode, the most common job in the U.S. is actually office and administrative support work. Around 21 million people do that kind of work in the United States. Over 14 million people are in sales, and more than 11 million work in food services. There are 2.8 million people who drive trucks for a living in the United States, which is no small number, but it is also not the lumbering behemoth that that particular NPR piece would have us believe. It is worth noting, however, that trucking is a fast growth industry. And though the interconnectivity of the hardware involved and the efficiency of the systems that are used are making it so that fewer shipments, fewer hauls, fewer truckloads are required to move the same amount of inventory each year, the amount of inventory and the amount of distribution that is required to fill all of the orders each year has also ensured that there have long been more trucker positions available than truckers to fill them. This is in large part due to the nature of the work, the incredibly long hours, the incredibly non-standard lifestyle that those hours lead to, the requirement of patience and ability to focus, but it's also due to the increasing number of standards and regulations and requirements and the high turnover rate from young people who tend to try it out, try out trucking, only to find out that it's not the way that they want to go. Those regulations and rules and the non-standard lifestyle that's required are just not a good fit for a lot of young people, at least compared to the on average older people who tend to fill the ranks of the trucking industry. The average age of a trucker actually is about five years higher than the average age of workers in the U.S. in general. So it is on average an older profession. This means then that the question of the trucking industry's future is already anything but certain. It's difficult to staunch the flow of qualified employees, especially when you are simultaneously dealing with all the issues that arise from immense growing pains as the trucking industry is right now. But the specter that much of the industry has seemed to be much more focused on and concerned by is the emergence over the last handful of years of autonomous trucks, that is self-driving trucks, that are completely capable of making the same drive that any trucker makes, and potentially without ever running the risk of making a single mistake and without ever needing to take a break or sleep or eat or use the bathroom. The very first shipment delivered by an autonomous truck, the shipment was 50,000 beers from Anheuser-Busch, by the way, 
was already delivered to its destination back in October of 2016. This autonomous truck was built by a company called Otto, O-T-T-O, which was started by a former Google autonomous car project employee and a former Google Maps product lead, among a few other very well-qualified individuals. And Otto was recently purchased by Uber. This company, Otto, is building ready-to-go autonomous trucks right now, and they are also producing kits of technology that can be installed on existing trucks and make them autonomous as well. Otto is getting a lot of vocal support from people of influence within the trucking field. Part of this has to do with the aforementioned dearth of truckers. There's just not enough people to drive all the trucks that they need to be driven to get all the deliveries where they need them to be within a reasonable amount of time. But it's also part of a larger pitch to the industry, I think, to show them that these trucks won't mean the end of their jobs. It will mean making their jobs easier and safer. There was an editorial on trucks.com recently by Joe Raskovas, the Director of Governmental Affairs and Communications for the Western States Trucking Association, and this article included a rallying cry for these autonomous technologies, and he likened the impact of these technologies to the impact that mobile phones had on the industry a decade earlier. He says that he remembers waiting for hours at roadside payphones, hoping to get in touch with dispatch to clarify directions or to call his family after days on the road. And mobile phones and the mobile internet that is installed in a lot of trucks these days helped free up a lot of that time and energy and improved his quality of life, but also made the entire industry a hell of a lot safer. He sees this autonomous technology as essentially the same thing, something that will augment truckers and add to their lives and allow them to enjoy their profession more and perhaps even bring in more truckers because the job will not be such a drag on a person's lifestyle. This, of course, is not necessarily the way things will shake out in reality. A move to eventually bypass drivers completely would be in the financial interests of the shipping companies and companies like Auto that are making the tech involved, because it would make the shipping industry more heavily reliant on Auto's intellectual property and hardware, and it would remove one of the biggest costs involved in the entire industry for the shipping industry and everybody who is attached to it in any way. It's important to remember that the CEO of Uber, which again owns Auto, has boasted many times, including once in an article on The Verge back in 2014, which I will also link to in the show notes, that he is intending to get rid of all the drivers that are working for Uber eventually. A quote from that article from CEO of Uber, Travis Kalanick, goes like this, quote, the reason Uber could be expensive is because you're not just paying for the car, you're paying for the other dude in the car. When there's no other dude in the car, the cost of taking an Uber anywhere becomes cheaper than owning a vehicle. So the magic there is you basically bring the cost below the cost of ownership for everybody, and then car ownership goes away, end quote. And the following paragraph in that same article on The Verge says, asked about what he would tell Uber drivers who will someday be replaced, Kalanick said that day was still a long way off, but it's also inevitable, he said. Quote, I'd say, look, this is the way of the world, and that world isn't always great. We all have to find ways to change with the world, end quote. His statement came a day after the company boasted that its drivers could earn $90,000 a year. And that is the end of the quote from that article. And so what we see there is somebody who is being two things at the same time. He is saying, one, this is a technology that will help out the drivers. This is something that we are doing to make their lives easier. And look, they can make a bunch of money working with us. They have every reason to be loyal. But then at the same time, within the same 
article within the same interview, he's also saying, but at some point we're definitely going to get rid of them because why wouldn't we? It will make the world better for us to do this. And it's quite possible that both of these things can be true at the same time, but it also does kind of put a ceiling on the promise that this technology is only beneficial and benevolent for the people currently working in these fields like Uber drivers and truckers. This conversation inevitably leads to this sort of conflict, I find. It's the type of conflict I got into more deeply on a past episode of the podcast. I think it was entitled Shoulds and Ours, because what we are discussing in this type of situation is an ideal world based on current environmental factors and concerns versus a potentially more ideal world, but one that is initially fraught with all kinds of horrible things for people who have not yet made it to that new environment, to that completely new and radical set of circumstances. What that means in this case is that truck drivers who are able to make use of the autonomous technologies while also maintaining their jobs will likely benefit from these amazing, frankly, technologies. These are really cool technologies that do potentially add a whole lot to a trucker's life and to their safety and potentially level of happiness. But the next step from that is almost certainly to get rid of them as part of the system completely, which sucks for them and anyone who is financially dependent on them. This thing then that is initially an asset within the current set of circumstances, a world in which humans drive vehicles, could very quickly become a replacement in a new set of circumstances wherein humans are no longer required to drive vehicles. That moment of happiness and beneficial assets gained from these technologies, however long it lasts, whether it's one year or a hundred years, could just be a stepping stone that to a situation that is far less beneficial to the people involved. Now the solution to this, and this is a thing that a lot of the technorati are thinking but not saying, mostly because it sounds a bit tech-utopian and fantastic and potentially even horrible by today's standards, depending on how you look at it, is that if we can automate enough of the tasks in our life, enough of this stuff, enough of these things that shape our environment and society, particularly the repetitive, somewhat menial tasks that take up a great amount of time for a great percentage of the population, then maybe we won't need to work so much, or maybe even at all. The truckers under this potentially tech utopian scenario, won't have work, of course, but maybe they won't need to work in order to sustain themselves at this point. If we can decrease the operating costs of shipping to 1%, let's say, of what it is today, which is a bit of a jump, but not outside the realm of possibility if you look at other fields that have been electrified and have had autonomous systems installed in the past. It's not outside the realm of possibility. So if we could reduce those costs of shipping to 1% of what it is today, wouldn't that cost savings, if it's passed on to the consumer, represent an overall savings, an overall gain for everyone who lives within this autonomous society? Would a job then and in particular a high-paying full-time job, matter quite so much if all of your expenses, because of a swath of different industries becoming autonomous, were 1% of what they are today. If your expenses were just 1% of what you have to pay to eat and shelter yourself and get healthcare and such today, how might that change your perception of work and what is required to operate within society. The reason this possibility isn't often mentioned by the founders of mainstream companies in particular 
is that it's not a world that can be guaranteed. That's not a promise that they can make. And by current standards, according to the way things operate today, the only predictable, realistic consequence of going autonomous in this way within the trucking industry is that the 2.8 million truck drivers who currently work in that field will lose their jobs. And the people who own these companies, the shipping companies and the companies who are using them to ship stuff, will see a decrease in costs and, as a result, an increase in profit. There will be no definite net gain for society, just more of the same with greater profits for a few and a whole lot of people worse off because they no longer have the jobs that they require to continue to operate within society safely and reliably. And I mentioned making a bunch of other fields autonomous as well. This is something that is not at all limited to the trucking industry. There are a lot of different industries, some of them a whole lot more luxury-based, the entertainments and fashion and things of that nature, while others are very fundamental. Other types of shipping or medical services and hardware, even things like governance, we are looking at a whole lot of different options and the potential for a whole lot of very sudden change within our current lifetimes, within the lifetime of people who are living today. And that could mean that this is not a localized threat or localized opportunity, if you choose to see it that way, but rather something that's quite expansive and that kind of umbrellas over essentially everything that is reliant in any way on technology. One other example that I thought was interesting that's also from within the shipping industry, but a different sector of the shipping industry, is FedEx, who is apparently hoping that by 2020, they will be able to hire just three or four pilots to manage a fleet of hundreds of planes around the United States, and they would operate these planes from a main pilot hub located essentially anywhere. The planes would be piloted autonomously, as many planes are today already, and this small group of pilots would be on hand primarily to watch for glitches or to handle anything that requires human attention, any type of confirmation and general overwatch tasks that humans can still do better than robots in the field, at least at this point. And so again, this is not a shipping and trucking focused issue. This is something that is widespread. And if it's not something that you feel personally affected by, or feel that you will be personally affected by it any time in the near future, that is probably just because you are not aware of the machinations that are happening in your particular field just yet. But just wait, give it a couple of years and wait for some company to come in and try to automate your field and you will know exactly how these truckers feel with all the good and the bad potential that comes with that. The second article that I want to unspool today is another case in which workers seem to be on the verge of having their jobs disappear and given to the robots. The China-based electronics manufacturer Foxconn, which is famous for producing most of the iPhones sold around the world, along with a bunch of other electronics, other phones, monitors, computers, etc., has told DigiTimes that it is rolling out automation in three phases across its network of factories around China. And there are a lot of these factories. The first phase is to bring automation to processes within their manufacturing that are either dangerous or immensely tedious. And therefore, human workers are not likely to want to do these things or do not do them well over time because their attention flags because it is so incredibly dull. The second phase is to automate the entirety of some production lines, which reduces the number of units required overall, since you no longer need to have robots that are interacting with humans, either receiving devices from humans to finish or handing off incomplete devices to humans who will then do the finishing. 
automating the entire system of a process reduces overall complexity. And then the third phase is to go completely human free, automating the entirety of all of the processes in a given factory and bringing in humans only for periodic inspections, logistics work, testing, things like that. The DigiTimes article notes that Foxconn already has 10 so-called lights-out production lines at their factories, which operate completely human-free. And they have many more factories than that that have reached stage 2 and 3. Here, again, we have an industry that is currently massively staffed. Foxconn alone in this industry employs about... 1.3 million people, or at least that was the number as of 2015. It might be a little bit more than that now. So it's massively staffed, but it's also making moves to reduce those human costs, the cost of human labor, and the cost of implementing safety measures for those humans as well. But they're doing this while also making their business more efficient and effective. The article notes that Foxconn already has 40,000 so-called fox bots deployed to do various tasks at their factories. And they have the in-house capability to build another 10,000 fox bots each year. And interestingly, once again, we have a representative of a quickly automating company assuring the public that humans will certainly continue to be necessary to their business. Foxconn Automation Technology Development Committee General Manager Das Jiapeng said that robots will not be able to completely replace workers because humans have the flexibility to quickly switch from one task to another. It isn't mentioned in the article whether he was smiling ironically when he said that or not, but it strikes me that when such statements are made, Those being quoted are careful to never indicate how many humans will be necessary in the future. There could be one human for every 10,000 foxbots, and he would still technically be correct and not at all misleading in saying what he said. The same could be said of the Ubers and Autos of the world. Humans will no doubt continue to be required, they might say, but they could be speaking of their own positions as CEOs, for all we know. The economics questions tied to automation are fascinating. Again, in part because for us to get the most out of these systems and this major potential changeover that we are looking at, we will need to see a lot of changes throughout society as a whole, not just in a handful of industries. It's quite possible for these changes to bring gains only for the fortunate few, creating greater economic gravity wells than already exist today, increasing the distance between the haves and the have-nots to ever greater degrees. Many forward-looking governments and business entities see this and are currently experimenting with guaranteed basic income schemes of different shapes and sizes, which seems like a good start even if these systems and their currently envisioned iterations are not what we actually need to fully harness these newfound abilities and resources that wide-scale automation could bring to society. But it is heartening to see the experimentation, at least, and I'll, I'll link to some of these in the show notes so you can take a look at what's being done today and the results that they have found so far. Another fascinating piece of this puzzle, though, is what automation of this kind will mean for us psychologically and socially what changes might emerge not just in how we view value and money and resources, but how we view ourselves and each other. There was a piece in Quartz the other day in which a robotics expert predicted that kids born today in 2017 will never drive a car They'll never need to, this expert claims, because by the time they come of age, autonomous cars and other systems of transport will be so ubiquitous and easy, and will be such obvious choices due to their incredibly low cost and immensely higher safety ratings compared to that of a human driver, that learning to drive will be like learning to churn butter. 
sure you could do it, and it will likely be picked up by some new iteration of the traditionalism worshipping hipster culture at some point as cool and fun and interesting. But the mainstream, just like with churning butter, will likely happily set it aside, especially once we start to see the benefits of leaving that responsibility to devices that can do it faster and generally better in almost every way compared to us. As soon as we are able to go a year as a country here in the United States with fewer than a dozen car-related deaths in the entire country compared to our current rate of tens of thousands, that will make it very, very clear that this is something that even the doubters will need to adopt. Because at that point, other interests will also kick in and amp up the pace of adoption. Insurance companies, for instance, might dramatically increase car insurance costs like tenfold if you do not get yourself an autonomous upgrade to your car. And the increase then of autonomous technologies, both the kits to augment existing cars and the new cars that will be rolling off the assembly line, along with the lack of new drivers of people who do not see the point in doing so, that will be a fate that seals itself. It will be a complete sea change for the way that we view driving in cars and transportation. Now, none of this is certain, of course. People have been predicting that in 10 years we'll all be trundling around in self-driving cars for decades now. And though there's more reason to believe the hype now than ever before, you could say the same of every year in which we've predicted this before in the past as well. Because with each new year, we have a new set of technologies and a new set of requisite milestones reached. It's impossible to know for sure how the dice will land on that particular confluence of milestones and technologies and regulations until they actually land and we can see what they read. But it's an interesting thought experiment regardless, and one that might help us cope with the monumental non-monetary changes that will come with any such sea change in the future. Trying to predict how we might feel about no longer being the drivers of our own cars. What happens to our perception of freedom and mobility when those ideas no longer feel like they are in our hands, that it's us turning the wheel and it is us controlling the machine that takes us where we want to go, and that it's instead a device, a device with actions that are determined by a collection of data and algorithms that necessarily to operate correctly is connected, it's tethered to some greater whole, rather than allowing us to go off in isolation. Will our perception of freedom shift when we are no longer prone to accidentally taking unlit back roads and maybe even potentially ending up at the wrong address? Will our feeling of ownership of the car, but also of our own destiny, change in any noticeable way. There are people who feel more independent and in charge when they are behind the wheel, to the point that they don't like to be driven by others because they do not like that loss of control. How will this shift impact that mentality? And on that same note, how might the shift toward automation change our perception about work of any kind, any type of job that we do? as a gauge of self-worth, if we are not bringing home the bacon, for instance, and instead have a regular amount of bacon, cash that is, given to us by the government each month, according to one of those guaranteed minimum income schemes, would that diminish our self-perception? Would we feel less like powerful, independent women and men? Would we feel less capable, less independent, less powerful and in control of our own lives? Would it change relationship dynamics? Would it change gender dynamics? How would social status be derived or demonstrated if not by income? How might the way that we peacock and posture change? How would we show how strong we are if the robots are the ones doing all the heavy lifting? And if any lifter bot could 
at its most basic, unupgraded level, lift a hundred times what we could do if we weight trained our entire lives? How would we show how smart we are if the robots could consistently beat us at any game we might play? There's a British TV show that recently came to the US called Humans that tackles some of these issues decently well. On one of the early episodes, there's a scene where there's a couple of teenagers sitting alongside a golf course, talking and watching some older people play, while robots, which have recently been introduced into society and who look just like humans, are caddying for those older golfers. One of the teens says to the other something along the lines of, if that robot were to play golf, it could hit a hole-in-one every time, but instead it caddies for us. I wonder how that recognition, how that realization of our inherent inferiority when it comes to certain tasks will hit us. Not recognition of the superiority of robots or computers or AIs or whatever we want to call it, but that we can build things that don't need our constant attention and maintenance. And that includes systems and societies that these tools that we've constructed free us from so many things and will continue to free us from even more of them on scale in the very near future, quite likely. I think that in even thinking about this, we are discovering that we've come to define ourselves in terms of the work that we do, of the way that we earn money, of the energy that we expend to keep things moving and repaired and functioning, of the things that we lift with muscle power, of the tasks that we complete and the sacrifices that we make for our families, to the point that if we suddenly didn't need to do those things anymore, we may have a kind of collective existential crisis. This is similar, I think, to what happens to many people who come into money later in life. They are people who have always defined themselves in terms of their work, of their effort, of the difficult frictions that all of us push against constantly from the moment we are conscious enough to do so until the moment we no longer can. The ones who go crazy or get depressed are the ones who stop doing the work they've always done, and they are the ones that fail to find some new task or new purpose. The ones who tend to survive are the ones who keep doing what they've found to be meaningful before, even if the specifics of that work change. But what if that's no longer an option? What if you found meaning in backbreaking work? Not because the work was something that you enjoyed, but because it shaped your day and it allowed you to take care of your family in such a way that it was clear then how you felt about them. Yes, you worked long shifts, and yes, you were battered and bruised at the end of all of it, but you did it because it was how you showed your love and how you quite tangibly demonstrated that you wanted your family to survive and thrive and eat and grow and have opportunities that you never had. How do you replace that feeling? How do you replace that set of implicit social indicators? I've seen some starry-eyed essays and talks by people who seem to believe that if we were all liberated from mundane labor, we would all become poets and scientists. I think that this may be true for some people. There are plenty of people out there who, had they the time, would spend a great deal of it writing and painting and composing. And I think the greater leveraging of autonomous systems with an accompanying governmental backbone system of new economics of some kind could actually make that happen, could liberate that time for them so they could spend more time being creative rather than simply earning a paycheck. But I also think we'll find a large number of people are not replaced, but instead temporarily displaced. We will need, I think, as part of whatever new system comes into place, should we bring a new system into place, a whole lot of programs that can help people retrain for new jobs and careers and possibly do this several times over the course of their lives as the need for latent human flexibility and malleability shifts from one industry to the next, 
from one set of tasks to the next, from one field of study to the next, many of us will find that we are increasingly augmented by machines, using them in the same way we've learned to use computers and smartphones, rather than wholesale replaced by them. Just like FedEx intends to do with those three or four pilots then, these systems will help ensure that each of us will be capable of doing 100 times the work that we could have done a few years ago by plugging us in and putting us in charge of these systems or showing us how to work alongside them just as our ancestors increased their capabilities by learning to work with horses and other beasts of burden. We will have some real challenges regardless, I think, when it comes to the perception of human purpose. And I think each different group, each different culture and nationality and even economic class will come to different conclusions and solutions when it comes to this topic. We will increase our capabilities and remove the necessity for our input in some cases, but we'll need to have an amplified structure for learning if we're going to keep people intellectually interested in a time where the job they're studying for might not exist by the time they're done with school, or in situations when they're planning on going into a field in which the robots have already surpassed us. There will no doubt continue to be a place for golfers in a world where robots can hit a perfect hole-in-one every time. And it may be that it's as part of a no-technology-allowed tournament, or maybe as part of a heavily augmented cyborg grand tour. Already in chess, the so-called centaur players, which are humans who use computers to augment their play, seem to consistently beat both solo humans and solo computer players. So there's reason to believe that there will be potential in that direction of humans augmented by machines in many fields, not just in competitive games and sports. Perhaps more bolstering than anything else would be a push for a collective understanding of who we are as a species beyond the value systems that we tend to cleave to which came into focus, which were really defined during periods of immense disparity and scarcity. And that continues today, the ones that are being defined and redefined today. It is still a time of disparity and scarcity. We live in a scarcity-based system, and the distribution of the resources that exist are wildly out of balance. If we want to benefit optimally from the shift toward increased automation, we will need to develop societies and ideologies that are not predicated on scarcity and in which we do not define ourselves in terms of how we perform within scarcity-based systems. We'll need to be able to say with certitude why we get up in the morning and get out of bed and do things when we're not required to by law or by fear of starving to death. We will have to identify social and individual purposes and drives outside of the existential ones that have prodded us along until this point in history. It could be argued, convincingly, I think, that it's a little bit early to be having these discussions. There are still a million different things we need to figure out and a million different discussions we need to have before such an immense shift, such a crazy overarching revolution could take place. But I also think that this is the kind of conversation we don't want to be starting just as the ground starts to shake and the movement is already underway. It's a conversation that I think could help guide that shift as well in a more practical and widely beneficial direction. This episode and every episode of Let's Know Things is brought to you by listeners just like you. If you are keen to contribute to the propagation and perpetuation of Let's Know Things, consider stopping by letsknowthings.com, click on the contribute link, and there you will find an array of different options of ways that you can contribute to the show. Things like leaving a review on iTunes or sharing the show with a friend. You can contribute monetarily. You can check out the sponsors of the show. Lots of different ways to contribute if you are 
picking up what I am putting down here and hope to continue to enjoy it just as I hope to continue producing it. A huge thanks to everyone who's already contributed in some way and thank you in advance, future contributors, if you are considering doing so. Among those sponsors you might want to consider checking out is Audible. I am a huge fan of both podcasts and audiobooks because audiobooks are essentially just very long podcasts. At any given point, I'm always reading a book on my Kindle and listening to a book from Audible. And the most recent listen is one that I would actually highly recommend. It's a book called Dark Money. The subtitle is The Hidden History of the Billionaires Behind the Rise of the Radical Right. And this is a book by Jane Meyer that goes into depth about the Koch brothers and other people like them who are essentially immensely wealthy individuals who moved from kind of a weird cult-like early libertarian political stance into essentially taking over the Republican Party. And what's described in this book, it's, it's a whole lot of stuff that took place well before the recent election here in the United States, but it goes a long way to explaining some of the groundwork that was laid for what happened. Some of the names of the people involved I was already aware of, the stories here are crazy, and the personalities are bizarre, and the manipulation and strategy behind it all is the type of thing that you listen to and say, oh my god, that is brilliant. It's a little bit evil, but you can't help but respect it for its tenacity and the innovation that went into it. So if you want to understand what politics in the United States look like today, but also the way, frankly, that politics work particularly when big money is able to get involved around the world. This is a great book worth checking out. That's Dark Money by Jane Mayer. And you can pick that up wherever you get your books, whether it's Kindle or Kobo, your local indie bookstore, your library. Or if you want to go to audibletrial.com LKT, you can use the free credit that you get to get that book for free. That is the way that I took this book in, and the narration is excellent, and the pacing is fantastic. So that is an excellent option if you are considering getting into the audiobook thing and want to support the show as well. audibletrial.com slash LKT. The other sponsor today is HostGator, my hosting company that I have loved working with for many years now. They are incredibly easy to use, incredibly pleasant people, every interaction I've ever had with them. Great customer service, top of the industry in my opinion. Having worked with the customer service of many different hosting providers and not being terribly impressed most of the time. And if you go to hostgator.com LKT, you will receive all of their wonderful services that they provide to everyone, along with a special discount that they give to listeners of Let's Know Things. That is hostgator.com slash LKT. If you are looking for hosting services, want to build a website, a blog, portfolio, whatever might be of interest to you. You can find out more about me and my work, including the books that I have written at colin.io. My blog is exilelifestyle.com. And you can find me personally pretty much everywhere on the internet at Colin is my name. If you go to letsnotethings.com, you will find the show notes for this episode and every episode, along with a bunch of other information about the show, including the aforementioned methods of contribution, should you choose to do so. You can find the show on social media at Let's Know Things. Thank you so much for listening. I am Colin Wright, and I will talk to you again next week. Mm-hmm.